Now, these two men both are very serious animation companies as well as the other films and uh, visual work they do. And when I started my career after motherhood and had several children, I got very interested in uh, children's uh, films. And I presented a project to Universal called Rock and Read, which was a compilation of music that was children's music put to rock and roll beats with rock and roll bands and storytelling. And that was quite a success. And at the same time that I was doing this project for the family division of Universal, a very delightful Welshman named Mike Young showed up with The Little Engine That Could, which was mm -hmm. a classic book, very mm -hmm. classic book, that his company in London, he actually had moved to London, was working in London for a while, and his company had done a fabulous uh, series of animation shows and had this book that they were going to convert to animation at the same time. So we became friends, joined partners, and did a big show called Horrible Histories that we did primarily with Irish voices and we did all of our dubbing in Ireland with Stephen Ray as our narrator. All right. There I was in Ireland. What could be a greater introduction than working with Stephen Ray every day doing these delightful children's stories called Horrible Histories that were actually a charming way of introducing children to history. We did 27 shows. Fantastic. And after the fact, he said to me, Tammy, I'm so grateful to you because it's the first time my boys, his little uh, children who were about 10 and 12 years old at the time, really liked something I did. <laughs> so that was very, very rewarding to me. Now, of course, uh, you wrote these uh, animation stories. Oh, yes, yes, indeed. But the, the big fun, the big fun was being in Ireland, working with Stephen and just having the excitement of, of hearing the words, not just writing them, which is, of course, part of filmmaking. It's one of the joys of filmmaking. You have a great actor say your words back. It's a thousand times better than when you saw it on paper. And it's the same thing with the images. You write an image, but then when you see it on the screen, and it was photographed by some immensely talented uh, uh, cinematographer, you are enthralled with your own image that you never knew could exist in the world for real. It was all an imagined image when you had it on paper. So these are the beautiful things that happen when you become a filmmaker. Now you do, of course, direct and produce yourself. So on many, many occasions, in fact, most occasions when you've made movies, you have directed your own script. Exactly. And how is it then when you work with other uh, cinematographers who are interpreting your, your written word, shall we say. It's, it's the most exciting relationship. It really is, because in other forms of art, although, of course, with technology, uh, other players become part of an artist's uh, work and process, mm -hmm. but nevertheless, I think in film, the team that makes a movie mm -hmm. is the most important part of the whole process. Mm -hmm. You cannot do this work alone. Mm -hmm. except if you're doing your MySpace <laughs> <laughs> video. But uh, in, in a general way, you are relying on a team that become like your family, mm -hmm. and they also become another part of your brain. Because when you show an image to a cinematographer, for example, you've taken a still photograph of the location that you want to use, mm -hmm. and, the st and the photographer says to you, well, I have a thought about another angle on this, and mm. they tell you something that you only dreamed of but couldn't even express yourself. This is like love. Mm. It's a crucial relationship. It's a crucial relationship that only enhances and enlarges your own vision of the world. Mm. So it's extraordinary. How often does one get that in life? Now, your latest film, Tamar, Red Roses and Petrol, which is coming out in fall of this year, 2007, is an adaptation of Joseph O'Connor's celebrated stage play. What drew you to O'Connor's story initially? Oh, well, 
certainly remember exactly where I sat and what I saw because it was one of the most gripping plays that I had seen in years. I was immediately attracted to it. It is wickedly funny. You never forget the laughs. And emotionally, just spot on. And I watched this drama about a family at each other's throats after the death of their father, played by Malcolm McDowell, who is a man that is a wonderful poet and a librarian and knows literature, but he doesn't know how to tell his own family that he loves them. And as a consequence of that, their entire lives have been filled with secrets and miscommunications and, and uh, building uh, up uh, grievances and uh, worrying about their mother who uh, they believe has been uh, denied a perfect love with the dad and on and on it went. And of course, the moment he dies, when they can all express themselves openly, the truth comes out. Mm. This is, to me, just a wonderful story about letting people know you love them when they're alive. Being able to tell each other the truth about things, I think, is one of the most important things in life. And it's so difficult. And when I saw the play, I immediately thought about having, having to turn this into a film because it really reminded me of my own family. Not that my own family specifically had these issues, but every family has these mm -hmm. odd, surprising troubles issues between themselves that they haven't been able to work out, mostly because of miscommunications. So I felt it was really a worthy subject and a very beautifully done play. And of course we had to change it a great deal for, for a film, but the heart and soul of the genius of Joseph O'Connor remained. Did you have any doubts about translating O'Connor's stage play into a film? I certainly did because there has always been a certain bias about plays converted to films. And particularly as this was an independent film that was done on a very tight budget, I knew that I would be up against some of the classic problems anyway, mm. which are that a play is in a very contained space, whereas a film has to move. Motion pictures got to be moving images, and when you're in a very small, confined space like a stage, there isn't much room to move it. Mm. So several things uh, occurred to me because I felt it was an important, important play to uh, do as a film, uh, was that I would treat the interior of the house where most of the action takes place. I would treat that as a giant arena in which I would choreograph the artists, uh, the players, and get them to move each one in a very individual way. And I actually had a choreographer work with me and work with our actors so that the different actors actually had different cadences, different ways of moving. The son Johnny literally flies in every time he appears in the scene and played by Max Beasley of course yes Max Beasley who of course was capable of doing this unlike some people who would land on their head I mean he thought of magical ways of uh, making his appearances and so on the other thing that's tremendously important when you convert stage to screen is that people that are not seen and the events that are not seen on stage that are only spoken of become real and that is a genuinely interesting and fun uh, assignment for a director. How do you bring the offstage things to life in the movie? Of course, that brought me to Ireland in a major way, which made me very happy, so that we were able to see the university, we were able to see the house where our family lived, and the bar, the pub, as they call it there, and I, I had a great time doing it.